Excellent. Um, thanks for coming. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm Carlos Castrin from the University of Washington and also from Apple. I'm going to talk about some work of my student, Marco Ribeiro, and also my postdoc, Samir Singh, who is now a professor at the uh, University of California in Irvine. And you might not have heard this, but I'm going to tell you some incredible secret now. Machine learning is hot. <laughs> you see area after area being disrupted by what I call intelligent applications. So these are applications that use machine learning at its core. They're differentiated by what they do with their data. And that's really, really exciting. But you start thinking about uh, some challenges as you think about bringing machine learning to production. So typically you start thinking about the application you want to build and the data you start with. And if you take my machine learning class, I'll say, well, you serve the data, you build some fancy machine learning model, and then you deploy those models to make real-time predictions, and you're done. But in reality, that's not the whole picture. There's a little gap between these two steps here. And the question here is, if you put your machine learning model in production, it's gonna make decisions about what to recommend or when something's fraudulent, and that thing does the wrong thing, you're gonna be fired. You're gonna lose your job. Somebody might die. So how do you know that you can trust that machine learning model to do exactly what you think it's gonna do? How can you build that trust and confidence in what you're doing? And that's a really fundamental question that has been underexplored in my field, which I am committed and our team is really committed to make a big difference in changing. So let's talk a little bit about that. So how do you know that you can trust this thing over here? For those who might not know us, this is an example of a famous neural network that tries to recognize digits. This is the early days ones. Now, um, usually, I think about the process of creating a model, trusting it enough to take it into production, and then deploy it into a real system. And by gaining this trust, I can apply it in many different ways. So for example, uh, when you go to Netflix, you often said, oh, you might like Lord of the Rings because you also liked, what's another movie? <laughs> Game of Thrones, <laughs> maybe. Um, and that's supposed to give, give me confidence that Netflix is doing something reasonable with my data, or with the services providing me. And that's good, that's good for gaining confidence in a system. But that's not the only place where understanding why a machine learning model makes a particular decision is fundamentally important. Take a system that a doctor can use. We talked about healthcare quite a bit in the previous section here. If the system says the probability that this patient has cancer is 90%, a doctor will typically ignore that system. Because he doesn't trust the system. But if she sees something like, look at this MRI, look at this latest study, look at these related cases, and that's why I'm predicting cancer, then the doctor is much more able to take actionable decisions based on what they see. And as a data scientist myself, I really want to understand what's going on so I can uh, improve the performance of my system. I can understand where it's failing and figure out ways to make it better. So trust and transparency in machine learning is extremely important. So how do we do this? How do we deal with trust today? There are different ways of doing it. Some folks advocate for what I call interpretable models. These are models that are simple enough to understand. Uh, and a good example of that is a decision tree. You might look at the simple decision tree and say, oh, I understand why this patient has cancer. But this decision tree will be highly inaccurate. To make it accurate, you have to make it something like this. Now is this an explainable, transparent model? It's kind of hard to say. So a second approach maybe is to look at the accuracy. Is this model performing well on some held out data that am I evaluating it on? And it turns out that accuracy can be extremely misleading. Let me give you an example. There's this famous data set from uh, news groups. How many people know what news groups are? Were? <laughs> These are the things that later were called forums and then are now called Facebook pages. And there are places where you post different articles. And the task there was really simple. You just, given the text of the article, can you predict what news group it came from? And every professor like me in the machine learning class would use this data set because basically any modern machine learning approach gets 94% accuracy. So it's good. But uh, when my student Marco looked at the data, 
and use his system to understand why predictions are being made, he noticed that the reason these algorithms were getting so much ar good accuracy is that they were using things like the email address of the sender. And we know that Matt at gmail.com always posts in the hockey forum, maybe? <laughs> and so obviously, it's easy to predict where those posts come from. But if you remove that kind of bad, misleading data, your accuracy will drop down significantly, something like 57%. And so something that seems to be working really well, high accuracy, might be doing so for uh, stupid or bad reasons. So accuracy is an important aspect, but it's not the only thing that you need to do. So what can you do? Often in practice, you do things like A-B testing, which uh, can be gold standards in some setting. They don't let you improve your system over time, and they tend to be really expensive and require a lot of data to do well. So if none of these methods are working, what do people really do in the real world to gain trust in the models? It's a technique that I call voodoo. <laughs> I looked at my model, it looked really cool, it was amazing, look at this one example, it was great. I'm gonna deploy it in production. So can we transcend this? Can we do something better? Is the question that we're interested in answering. And so our idea is to make models of machine learning more interpretable and basically explain the predictions of any model. Any model you give me, even a complicated neural network. So here's the idea. Let's say you have an input like easily the best sushi in Seattle and I wanna uh, build a classifier to figure out with whether this is a positive or a negative sentiment, sentence. So in this case, clearly positive. And I ask you, why is it positive? You can explain it. You can say things like, easily best is associated with positive sentiment. So you can find some way to transparently explain why a prediction is being made. Then I can begin to gain confidence in what's going on and I can find places where it's doing bad things. So how do we do this? and what does it mean uh, in more details. So let's do that by, by uh, using a little user study that demonstrates the system that uh, my student Marco built. Um, I hope everybody signed the form in the back before coming in. I'm gonna do a user study. I have an IRB to start, yes. So this user study addresses a very important problem for us. We're at the University of Washington and our mascot is, oops, how do you go back? Our mascot is a husky. And they look a lot like wolves, but we always bring huskies to the stadium during games. And if we by mistake we'll bring a wolf, thousands of people might die. <laughs> and so we wanna build a system based on a deep neural network that's able to predict whether that's a husky or a wolf. But we're okay if that system, we trust it as long as it has one in six accuracy or better. If you won in six games, thousands of people die, I'm okay with that. So Mark can build a system using a standard neural network that got about one in six accuracy, and this is the kind of results that he is getting. So, meets our accuracy criterion. My question is, do you trust this system? Do you trust this model to make that decision at this rate of accuracy? Raise your hand if you trust this model. Okay, raise your hand if you don't trust this model. If you don't trust this model, is it because you don't trust me? Raise your hand. <laughs> um, why don't you trust this model? What's that? Because the failure is not terrible? No, I'm saying, let, let's in general, do you believe that this is getting six, uh, one in six accuracy? Like one is only making five, five out of six accuracy. That's my question to you. Do you trust that accuracy rating? Right, is that what, that's what I mean by trust in this example. And if you stare at it for a little while, it might be hard to say whether you trust it or not. But if you use the system that Marco built, he's able to highlight the parts of the image that were most significant in making this decision. And I'm highlighting here, for each image, uh, what was the predicted and the true label, and what was the, the, the system used to make predictions? And now I ask you, do you trust this model? And if not, why not? So take a look at the wolf predictions. Have I really built a wolf detector? 
or have I built a very, very deep snow detector? <laughs> So figuring out that something gets a certain level of accuracy doesn't mean that it's working for the reasons that you think it should be working. So we wanna have something that you can have explanations like what I showed you that what Marco had that can be used for any system, even a complicated network. So I want to be them, them to be interpretable so that a human can look at them and they make sense. So uh, a very big decision tree is not interpretable, but maybe a simple one potentially could be interpretable. That's, a, that's questionable. I want it to be faithful, so I want it to behave like the model would behave. In other words, if I have a model to predict the prices of houses and it looks like this, I don't want an explanation that has nothing to do with that model, like that simple orange line there. It's simple, but it doesn't have anything to do with how the model behaves. I want it to be model agnostic. It has to work for anything, even uh, crazy, crazy models that you might come up with. So. How do you do this? How do we make this happen? And I want to be able to implement, uh, explain this mess over here. So how do we make this happen? Well, uh, Marco came up with a system that we call Lime, and it generated examples that I showed you before, and it allows you to explain the predictions of any um, machine learning model. It's really cool. Uh, it's gotten a lot of uh, traction in academia over the last several months, and uh, I'm gonna give you just a quick, 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 quick sense of it, but I won't be able to go into details in this short period, but I'll be around later if folks wanna ask me more questions. But the idea here is, let's pick a class of interpretable models. Let's pick something that we believe a human can understand. Maybe it's a simple decision tree, maybe it's a simple uh, linear model, something. And what we're gonna do is uh, explain a complex decision in terms of simple ones. But notice that a simple model is not gonna explain a complex model everywhere, but what we're gonna show is that in the context of particular prediction, so let's say in this very complicated space, if I look at why I predicted this point to be positive, a simple line might be enough to explain. Locally, things which are to the left of the line tend to be positive, things to the right of the line tend to be negative. And the simple idea of a simple model that's locally good is what led to those examples with the snow detector uh, in the deep neural network. Now, um, just to give you another example of this in action, um, if you take that 20 news groups example where I said the email address was being used as a key feature and you use the uh, Lime on it, you'll see that the main features it's using are things like the email address of the poster, um, I'm highlighting here the university, things like this have nothing to do with the actual text that you expect to make, uh, be associated with uh, what the forum is about, whether it's about hockey, religion, and so on. So this is what Marco used to discover the problems in the data that have been around for about 20 years in my field. So uh, I'm just gonna jump ahead and uh, show you some evaluations and then uh, we can talk a little bit more about it. So Marco wanted to figure out whether explanations would be useful uh, for folks who are not machine learning experts. They're useful for him, but uh, would it be useful for somebody else? So here's what he did. He took the example, the, the 20 news groups example, where if you train with the 20 news groups, but you test on clean data, you only get 57% accuracy, so it's not good. And he cleaned that data, he removed all the features that he thought was bad, all the stuff that he thought didn't make any sense, and created a gold standard data set. And with that gold standard data set, if you train a machine learning model, you get about 70% accuracy. And here's the question that he wanted to answer. And uh, this is a really interesting question. He was gonna show these explanations to mechanical turkers. So these are people that don't have machine learning background and tell them, if you see something that doesn't make any sense, just cross that out. So if you see Matt's email address, cross it out if you think it doesn't make any sense. We don't give him any guidance other than cross out any features that you think are irrelevant. And Marco wanted to answer the question whether in a few rounds of mechanical Turk experiments, he could get accuracy that was close to the gold standard that he spent all his time cleaning the data. And after just three rounds of mechanical turkers, he actually got better accuracy than his gold standard. And so I fired him. 
just kidding. Marco is an amazing student. He's really good. Uh, but uh, it turns out the mechanical turkers, when viewed with uh, explanations and uh, justifications, even though they're not machine learning experts, can do even better than somebody manually cleaning a data set, which is absolutely surprising to me. Marco also showed that uh, mechanical turkers could separate models that were uh, not good from models that were good. And, uh, and I won't have time to uh, explain this. I'm running out of time, so I want time to explain this. But uh, they were able to find uh, discern trustworthy models from other models uh, very accurately, which was pretty cool. And this approach can also be given useful to get insight on how something works. So I showed you the deep learning example, but let me show you one more fun example. So here's an image, and uh, we run an image classifier on that that's trying to detect one object only in the image. It thinks the image only has one type of object. And it's a little confused, but it says it's equally probable that we see an electric guitar, an acoustic guitar, or a Labrador which all makes sense. Now if you run it through Marco's explanation and ask, what is the explanation? What are the parts of the image that support electric guitar? What are the parts of the image that support acoustic guitar? What are the parts of the image that support Labrador? This is what you see. And it makes a lot of sense. It's really super cool. You see, for example, that uh, acoustic guitar has to do with the body of the guitar, where electric guitar uh, pulls out more on the arm of that guitar. And explanations, um, uh, actually, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up in a second. So, so if you go back to the snow example, if we, uh, the, the user study we did, we actually did a user study for real in a very controlled setting. And if you show the data to users beforehand, about uh, 10, uh, 10 out of 27 users trusted the bad model in a well-formed question, and 12 out of 27 users um, were very smart and discovered this no issue in the data right away. But after you show the explanations, 25 out of 27 users discovered snow as a potential problem in this prediction task, which was super cool. Explanations can also lead to better decisions. So one of the um, things that we've done, for example, is use explanations in the context of churn prediction, figuring out who's likely to stop using a service. And you can see that if you just say the probability that Matt is gonna stop using the service is 0.9, is not that useful, but you can say, you know, Matt used to shop um, in the baby section of this site very frequently for two years, but suddenly stopped shopping, then that tells me a little bit about the kinds of campaigns I can do to target him better. So explanations can also be useful to make better decisions from the predictions that you made. So in summary, we've been thinking a lot about this idea of making machine learning more transparent and building trust in the model. In the past, I've only thought about things like quantitative evaluations, getting a certain accuracy level, or maybe even trying out the model and exploring manually uh, and, getting, and getting a sense of how it behaves. But I think what we really have to do is to bring this notion of explanations into machine learning that really gives us deep insights into why a model is making a particular prediction and how we can make it better. Thank you. Right. Wonderful.